Hello and welcome to another week of ECE 108. This week we're going to continue our discussion of combinatorics by introducing some concepts that will help us to tackle those problems that I introduced in lecture 18. So without further ado, let's get into it. So the first thing we're going to talk about are permutations. So for any non-negative integer n and any non-negative integer m that's less than or equal to n, we're going to define a m out of n permutation to be an arrangement of m of the n objects. So to be a bit more explicit here, I have a collection of n objects and I want to pick m of those objects and arrange them. That's what a m out of n permutation is. So now if m is equal to n, then we simply call any arrangement a permutation of the m items. So let's give some examples of this. So consider the set S that includes the elements M, A, T, H, R, O, C, K, S. So for this set, I can talk about various M out of N permutations. For instance, T, A would be a two out of nine permutation. So here explicitly, there's nine elements in S and T, A consists of two of these elements taken at random, if you will, and put in some order. So similarly, arm would be a three out of nine permutation because I pick three elements. Uh, hack would be a four out of nine. Actor would be a five out of nine permutation. Starch would be a six out of nine permutation. Stomach would be a seven out of nine permutation. Uh, if I took the string math rocks, that would be a permutation or a nine out of nine permutation if you want to use the upper definition here. So this is the basic idea of a m out of n permutation. I just take m elements and I put them in some order. So Scrabble, anyone? So a natural question I can ask for doing combinatorics is how many m out of n permutations are there? And we care about the answer to this question because whenever I was doing a ordered without replacement problem, I'm essentially computing the number of m out of n permutations. So how could I compute the number of these m out of n permutations? Well, if I want to arrange m items coming from a set containing n elements, there's going to be n ways to pick. So w to p is short for ways to pick the first item. And after I pick the first item, since I'm not replacing the elements of the set, I only have n minus one ways to pick the second item. And this process continues until I pick the nth item. And here I'd have n minus m minus one ways to pick the nth item. So now I'm going to give you a theorem. Again, you don't have to explicitly cite this theorem in your work. I'm just giving you it as a theorem to make things a little bit more formal in some sense. So if p sub n comma m denotes the number of m out of n permutations, then p sub m comma n is equal to n factorial divided by n minus k quantity factorial. So why would this theorem be true? Well, let's just give a sketch of a proof real quick. So up above here, I gave a combinatorics argument for how many m out of n permutations there are. So ultimately here, what I'm going to do is basically recreate this argument and show that this product can be written in this form. So for the sketch of the proof, I know from above that this is the number of m out of n permutations. And further, I can rewrite this to be this product here. So explicitly, the only thing that's changing from this line to this line is I distribute out this negative. So if I just look at this for a second and kind of compare it to n factorial, I can note this kind of looks like n factorial, right? Other than instead of stopping at one, I stop at this element here. So it's like n factorial, but I stop short. So explicitly, I have p sub n comma m is equal to this product here, so this thing here. And this is equal to this product here where I keep multiplying all the way down to one divided by this term here. So explicitly, this term cancels out this term here, so I recover exactly what I started with. So now by definition, this on the top is n factorial, and the term on the bottom is going to be n minus m factorial. So from there, I get this, and that's the basic idea for the proof of this theorem. 
Okay, so now that we have this theorem, we can apply it to problems to make our lives a little bit easier. We, we no longer have to go through the combinatorics argument that I used up here. We can immediately appeal to this theorem to simplify the process of solving problems. So now let's look at a couple of examples. So how many ways can you pick and order five cards out of a deck of 52 unique cards? Okay, so here I want to pick five elements out of a set of 52 unique elements. Well, that's just the number of five out of 52 permutations. So from here, how many of these permutations are there? Well, I know it's going to be P52, 5. And what is P52, 5? Well, that's 52 factorial divided by 52 minus 5 factorial. So for some problems, it's sufficient for you to stop maybe at this point if the numbers are obscenely large. But in this case, it's not too bad to simplify this out, so let's do this. So 52 divided by 52 minus 5 quantity factorial, what will that be equal to? Well, this simplifies to 47 factorial. And by definition, 52 factorial divided by 42 factorial, that's just 52 times 51 times 50 times 49 times 48. And again, this term here is what I would find if I tried to approach this example using a counting argument similar to what I used in example two. So from here, how many permutations are there? Well, it's going to be this number here. Now note, depending on your calculator, if I asked you to give the exact number for P of 52, 5, you might get an overflow error if you directly tried to use the permutation calculator in your calculator or compute 52 factorial directly. So you may need to do shortcuts like this to get the actual correct answer. Okay, so example two. How many ways can you rearrange the letters in supercalifragilisticexpialidocious? Well, let's look at this uh, word. This word has 34 letters in it. So we might think that the answer would be P of 34 comma 34 or simply 34 factorial. But this is not correct. If I go back to that theorem, here I was working with a set containing n elements, and we know the elements of a set are unique. So this theorem only applies to permutations where the elements that I'm taking from the set are unique. So how do we address this deplorable issue? Well, here to be explicit, some letters are repeated, and we now need to remove these duplicate permutations. So how are we going to do this? Well, this will be similar to what I did in examples 3 and 5 in lecture 18. So I need to know what letters are repeated and how many times the letters are repeated. So here we could go through and count all these letters to figure out which ones are repeated, but I've already done this using Python. Uh, so the repeated letters are A, C, E, I, L, O, P, R, S, and U, and these are the number of times each one of those are repeated. So thus, this total number here that I computed, when I just computed permutations without considering duplicates, can be split into a bunch of categories that are the same word. So how do I get rid of all of these extra categories? Well, we need to divide by the number of ways each of these letters can be permuted to be able to find the number of unique rearrangements. So here, that's to say that I'm going to take my 34 factorial and I'm going to divide it by P sub n comma n or simply n factorial, where n is going to be each of these letters here. So to be explicit here, n is simply the number of ways that each one of these letters is repeated. So to be explicit, the number of rearrangements is 34 factorial divided by 2 factorial to the fifth. So here I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 2. So that's why I get to the fifth. 3 factorial to the fourth uh, because I have four threes that appear here. And 7 factorial because I only have one 7 that appears here. So again, dividing by this number here is simply dividing by all the possible ways that I can rearrange, say, the letter A with any of these other two letters A sitting here, uh, or the letter C with any of the other letter Cs, etc. So here, this is a number I would not expect you to calculate analytically if you use a lot of the calculators that are available to you, it will give you a number that is not correct because it rounds off since it has to use doubles uh, in this case. 
but here this number is exactly equal to this number here. So yeah, that's a lot of rearrangements, but it's a lot less than 32 factorial here. Okay, so we can take this idea and turn this into a theorem. So what I'm going to call the generalized permutation theorem. For i is equal to 1 up to k, if there are n sub i indistinguishable items of type i, and the sum of all of these n sub i from i is equal to 1 to k is equal to n, then there are, using this new notation, numbers of ways to arrange these items. So explicitly here, I'm taking n factorial up here, and I'm taking the product of each of these terms factorial and dividing by that. So the left-hand side, so this expression here, is sometimes referred to as a multinomial coefficient. We're not going to do anything with multinomial coefficients, but we will do things with binomial coefficients. And from there, after you see that material, you can kind of get an idea of where this comes from or why we might call it a multinomial coefficient. So before we go forward, uh, let's re-examine the example on the previous slide and think of it in terms of this theorem. Well, here I only divided by the number of permutations for the letters that were repeated, and the theorem on the next slide says I should divide by the number of permutations for all of the letters. So let's kind of look at why I didn't do that here. Well, let's pick on the letter D. There is only one D in this word, so I would want to divide by the number of ways I can change D with itself. Well, there's only one way that I can do that, so I would divide by one, and when I divide by one, it doesn't change the answer, right? So in practice, you don't need to divide by all of the n sub i's factorial. You only need divide to divide by the ones that are greater than one. Okay, so putting all of this together, permutations are the tool needed to solve ordered without replacement problems. So anytime I give you a question that's an ordered without replacement type problem, you should think permutations. Sometimes you might need to do something fancy by dividing by uh, certain permutations, but this is the basic idea here. Now let's go on to a different type of problem. Sometimes we don't care about the order, right? So let's look at an example. In five card draw poker, each player is given five cards out of a deck of 52 unique cards. And we might want to know how many hands are there in five card draw. Well, here, since the order of the cards in our hands does not matter, this will not be a straight permutation, but I'll need to do some modifications to get rid of the duplicate hands. So let's look at this. So, well, previously I found that the number of ways that I can pick five cards out of a deck of 52 cards was this term here, this P52 comma five. So this was in the case where I did care about order and now I don't care about order. So I need to ask the question, how many ways can I rearrange five distinct cards, right? I pick five distinct cards out of the 52. This is the number of ways I can do that. Some of these are rearrangements of the same five cards. How many rearrangements are there? Well, the number of ways that I can rearrange five cards is P5, 5 or just five factorial. So from here, I know that there's going to be P52, 5 over P5, 5 which is 52 factorial divided by 52 minus 5 factorial. This term here is coming from this uh, P of 50, 5, and this will also be divided by 5 factorial just coming from here. So this is simply equal to 2,598,960 poker hands. So one kind of thing to note here, uh, within the rules that are used in five card draw poker, we have some extra restrictions such that some of these hands are essentially the same hands, even though they have different cards. So in practice, this is larger than the number of poker hands that we really care about. So just keep that in mind. I might actually put that as a question for a assignment or maybe even on the final to compute uh, the number of poker hands with extra restrictions applied to them. So yeah, uh, from here we can note that for n greater than 
m, we have this expression n factorial divided by n minus m factorial times m factorial. This appeared right here, and we're going to give this a name. So without further ado, definition. For any non-negative integer n and any non-negative integer m that's less than or equal to n, we define this symbol here to be equal to this expression that we had on the previous slide. So this is going to be called n choose m because I have n objects and I'm choosing m objects out of it, or a combination. So notice here I can call it a combination without referring to the variables, or also a binomial coefficient. More on this in the next lecture. So further, if m is greater than n, I'm going to simply define m choose n to be 0. So in this case, it's asking, like, how many ways can I pick six objects out of a collection of five objects? Well, there's no way I can do it, so that's why we define this to be 0. So oftentimes students can be confused when they first see this, and they can get confused when dealing with various computations. So let's give a few examples of how to simplify binomial coefficients. What would n choose 0 be for any positive integer n, or any non-negative integer n? Well, here this by definition is simply n factorial divided by n factorial times 0 factorial. Well, we know 0 factorial is equal to 1, and when I take n factorial and divide it by n factorial, I'm just going to get 1 since I'm dividing by itself. So in this case, this will be equal to 1, no matter what n is. Next, let's look at n choose 3. How would I simplify this? Well, by definition, this is n factorial divided by n minus 3 quantity factorial times 3 factorial. So here, how would I expand this out? Well, let's be a bit more explicit than what the slides say on their own. So here, n factorial would be n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 times n minus 3. And I would continue with extra terms here until I end up with a 1. And this would be all divided by so n minus 3 factorial, that's n minus 3 times n minus 4, da 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 all the way down to 1. And 3 factorial, well, we'll just write that as 3 factorial for now. So here I can notice that these terms cancel with these terms when I divide. So in this case, if I wanted to evaluate this, uh, 3 factorial is just 6. So from here, this would be n times n minus 1 times n minus 2, all divided by 6. So in practice, if n is rather large, you might not be able to compute this uh, in your calculator in a nice way, but you can compute this. So just keep that in mind. Uh, sometimes I will ask for an explicit number. If you use, uh, say, n choose 3 in your calculator, depending on which calculator you're using, or if you use n factorial, you might get a number that you can't evaluate. But if you use this form here, you can evaluate it in your calculator. So let's just elaborate on that a little bit more. So say if I had a problem where 10,000 choose 3 was my final answer, if you were to compute 10,000 factorial in your calculator, it's this awful number that just keeps going and going and going. Uh, if you were to plug this into a standard calculator, it will overflow. So to give an example of that, if I Google using 10,000 factorial using Google's calculator, it says it is undefined and gives me a Justin Bieber video. Go figure. Uh, so, so there you might not be able to compute uh, 10,000 choose 3 by simply taking 10,000 and dividing it by 10,000 minus 3 factorial times 3 factorial, like this here. But the final answer is small enough that most calculators should handle that. So if you do use this process here, where you take where you take 10,000 times 9,999 times 9,998 and divide that by 6, you can actually compute the answer. And if I do that using Google, I get the exact same number that I did using this software here. So do keep that in mind. Generally speaking, I won't ask you to compute a number that isn't computable via your calculators by using, say, some simplifications like this, but some of the numbers might not be computable analytically in your calculators.
if you just blindly plug them in. So just keep that in mind. Okay, so that example aside, in choose in. How many ways can I pick in items from a group of in items? Well, a priori, just by definition, we think this would be equal to one, or it should be equal to one since there's only one way, one way to pick in items out of a group of in things. Well, analytically, let's see if this agrees. So here, this would be in factorial divided by n minus n factorial times n factorial. Well, this is just our friend zero factorial. So this is exactly what I had up here, just swap zero and n factorial. So this is one, which is what we thought it should be. So finally, six choose two, what would this be? Well, this would be six factorial divided by four factorial times two factorial. So here, I could ask you conceivably to do this without a calculator. If this was in a course where we had a closed book in-person final, uh, I would ask you to compute this without a calculator. Uh, so since this is not that type of a course, you will have a calculator uh, accessible to you, but it's still useful in practice to know how to compute these without a calculator. So how could I do this? Well, the six factorial and the four factorial simplify by this process over here. So if I did that, I would end up with six times five divided by two factorial, and two factorial is just two. So this would be six times five divided by two, which will simply be 15. Okay, so those examples aside, note that combinations are the tool that's needed to solve unordered without replacement problems. Okay, now let's look at a couple of mixed examples. So your favorite restaurant has a special combo deal where you and your group of friends can pick five different dishes to share out of eight options. So we can ask a natural question, how many ways can you pick the five dishes? Well, when I give you a question like this, you need to ask yourself a few questions. One, what is it asking to start with? And then two, uh, does order matter for this question? And is this a problem with or without replacement? Well, in this case, I say we can pick five different dishes to share. So that means the dishes that we're going to pick are going to be unique. And if I'm saying that they have eight options at a restaurant, uh, generally speaking, the options are going to be distinct and not the same thing. So here, this is a problem without replacement where everything is distinct. Uh, and secondly, does order matter? Well, it doesn't matter if dish one comes first and then dish two. Uh, you could argue personally that it could matter depending on what the dishes are. But in this case, you're still having the same meal. So order doesn't matter and we are not repeating. So explicitly, since we're not, not allowed to repeat a dish, we have five different dishes, and the order does not matter, this is an unordered without replacement problem. So in order to solve an unordered without replacement problem, I need to use a combination. So in this case, I wanna know what eight choose five is. So eight dishes, I'm choosing five of them. So in this case, eight choose five is just simply this quantity, which then you can compute using either the shortcuts there or just throw it in the calculator. And this would be 56 ways to pick the five dishes. So one key thing to note for these problems, while it can be very tempting to just always jump in and try to use a combination to find the answer here, being able to understand what combinations are really doing and understanding why you can use a combination on this problem is very, very important. And there's lots of problems I can give you that are kind of hybrid problems where you need to go through the counting arguments that I used over here to solve them. So it's not just sufficient for this course to memorize these theorems and when you can apply them. Sometimes the theorems won't apply directly. So just keep that in mind. You do need to think a little bit more deep, deeply than just plug it into the formula here. Okay, so let's look at another example. You and your friends can't decide what to pick. So you ask each person to rank their top five favorite dishes out of the eight options. How many possible top five rankings are there? Well, again here, order matters in this case, since uh, if I swap the ranking of dish one with dish two, that changes my top five ranking list. And here we again are picking different dishes. So this is without replacement. 
So in this case, we're not allowed to repeat dishes in order matters. Thus, I'm using an ordered without replacement type problem, and I want to use a permutation. So in particular, this will be p of 8 comma 5, which is simply 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 times 4, or simply 6,720 possible lists. So yeah, these are very useful tools for taking simple problems and very quickly being able to address them without having to think about the particular details of the problem or potentially making errors along the way, but they are limited in their scope, so just keep that in mind. So now we've covered quite a few methods in the last four lectures, so let's give a TLDR t recap for the various methods that we have so far. And do keep in mind, for some problems, you might need to use multiple methods together to be able to solve the problem completely. So if I'm asked to pick an ordered pair x comma y, where x comes from a set x, y comes from a set y, and the, uh, and the cardinality of x and y are m and n respectively, the number of ways I can do this is simply m times n. And in the case where x is equal to y, this is my ordered with replacement problem. Next up, if I want to pick k ordered items from a list of indistinct items with replacements between picks, this would be my ordered with replacement problem. There are n to the k number of ways to do this. So this is my example one that I considered in lecture 18. Next, if I want to order indistinct items, that's going to be a permutation of the n items, and the number of ways that I can do that is n factorial. Kind of following along this same type of problem, if I want to pick and order k items from a list of n distinct items, that's where I use my p of n comma k, which would just simply be equal to n factorial divided by n minus k quantity factorial. And again, that's my ordered without replacement problem. Similar to the examples two and three, I believe, that I did in uh, lecture 18 or example two in your textbook. Next, another type, of common, another type of permutation type problem that I could consider is ordering n items from a list split into m groups of k sub i identical objects of type i. So this is my banana type problem or my supercalifragilisticexpialidocious type problem where I use this multinomial coefficient m with all of these elements here. And again, that's n factorial divided by k sub 1 factorial times k sub 2 factorial, da da da, up to k sub n m factorial. And finally, the last kind of general rule that I've given is if I want to pick k items from a list of indistinct items where order does not matter, that is n choose k, which again is n factorial divided by n minus k factorial times k factorial. So again, I want you to treat these as tools to apply to various problems and keeping in mind that not all problems will be directly solvable just by simply applying one of these tools on their own. Uh, a good example of that would be how I introduced the idea of doing n choose k or n choose k1 comma k2 up to km. Uh, there, I started with the permutation, and I divided by various permutations to cut out the duplicate values in my list. So being able to understand how to drive these two bottom elements here is, in practice, more important than memorizing these formulas. Okay, so for your assigned reading, I want you to read pages 70 through 73. So in there, examples 15 and 16 are examples of doing permutations and examples 17 and 18 are examples of doing combinations. I would like you to read and go through both of those examples. They're spelled out in detail and, and the processes demonstrated in those two examples are very useful to have seen at least once. Uh, in particular, a lot of your homework problems will need those type analysis. That said, I'd like you to keep in mind that next week we're also covering a bunch of uh, combinatorics type problems. So your assignment next week will also include combinatorics problems that use these various elements here, along with a couple other techniques. So you will be seeing a lot more of examples of how to evaluate uh, the more complex type problems next week.
And that's when I'll start testing you on the more complex type problems. Okay, uh, beyond that, we have a meme when you realize a combination lock is actually a permutation lock. So here, a true combination lock order wouldn't matter. So if the uh, password for the lock was one, two, three, four, it would also accept four, three, two, one. So it's a lot less strict. So if it was actually a combination lock, uh, it would be a lot easier to break. I mean, that said, these locks are pretty easy to pick anyways. But yeah, so there's our meme for the day and have a wonderful day.